Hello, adventurers, and welcome to the Random Adventurers Podcast for the fourth week of November. I'm your host, Nate, and I'm here in the studio with Ranger Liz. Yep. Ryan. Hello. And today, we're going to be talking about Warhammer 40k and related properties. Uh, the Dominion deck building card game. And another game series I'm thankful for, Legend of Zelda. Alright, this week I'll be starting us off with Warhammer 40k. Now, Warhammer 40k was not the first uh, tabletop miniatures war game that did not use a board that I ever played. Uh, that goes to Privateer Press's War Machine, which I played first. But, to some degree, War Machine did not have the level of customization that I was looking for. And then I got introduced to Warhammer 40k, where there was more unit customization available. And the troops were balanced out based on a point value, and the individual weapons that they could take as upgrades were also balanced out based on point value. So while I could take a standard troop of 10 Space Marines... I could then upgrade one of them with a heavy weapon and maybe upgrade one of them with a special lighter weapon. Or I could take a group of Eldar and give them, you know, some other weapons upgrades, upgrade the weapon on the commander or the sergeant, you know, customize my captain of my army. <clears throat> All of that just gave it a more personal feel and made my army feel unique to me. Which I really did enjoy. The Warhammer 40k does have a longer history behind it and a much and a very broad and well developed lore. Which, for those of you who can't tell, I am a big lover of lore. I love having the game system or the, you know, war game or whatever I'm playing have a very well constructed universe around it, which helps to explain why these two armies might be in conflict. Now, of course, when you have Space Marines versus Space Marines, there's quite an obvious reason why two loyal Space Marine units are fighting each other. It's called a training exercise. I was going to say they were given conflicting orders. Or that, too. Sometimes, <laughs> oops, order snafu happens. I wasn't even going to credit to an oops. That, yeah, that also happens too. Plus, Space Marines, um, they can be pretty jealous. The Imperial Guard... If Jealousy hasn't been bred out of them? Well, they're just normal humans who've been upgraded. I thought they were, I thought, like, they were breeded in vats. No, no, the, the Imperial Space Marines are not bred in vats. What they do is they take some youth, put them through a trial. If they survive it, congratulations, we're going to make you a Space Marine and give you several genetic oper or several operations stick some genetically modified organs in you and implant a genetically mo a genetic modifying virus in you that's going to mm. pump up your testosterone levels to 11. Thought I heard something about selective breeding there too, so. Uh not really, no. Okay. Um some space marine chapters do only recruit from certain worlds where maybe there's some selective breeding going on. And of course, you know, Matt Ward with, you know, the previous editions, you know, left out one highly important detail that has been ignored since second edition of Warhammer 40k. Can Space Marines procreate? Nobody knows. It's all big up in the air. Second edition, yes, they did procreate. They did produce new Marines. Currently, though, that, that's just been completely ignored. Nobody has wanted to touch that question. Okay. But yes, I love I love the lore around Warhammer 40k. I love just all of that. I, though, have stopped playing it for only one reason. And that is those bastards at GW keep jacking up the prices. I was going to say money. It's got to be money. It's money. That's the only thing keeping me out of it, is the prices keep going up and up, and the return on fun keeps staying at the same level, 
So I'm basically losing return. So my demand has now switched over to Privateer Press and to DreamPod9 because those two companies are currently not trying to screw their customers. There's even some rumor right now that uh, Games Workshop might be planning to sell because they are, you know, their business plan of raise the price, put fewer minis in the box, has like not been assume, working for them. I'd like to assume somebody over there has some idea what they're doing. They're probably taking <clears throat> the movie theater stance. Make the cups smaller, raise the price. That is, that's pretty much what they're doing. I, I, I don't remember the cups being smaller at the movie theaters oh, when I go they, to... They did. Jay, I had a friend that used to work in a movie theater also, and she said the cups and stuff got smaller, and they increased the price. <laughs> Do they advertise them at the lower uh, ounce size? They might. No. Well, yeah, they, they advertise them as as what they were. Okay. Yeah. But, um, it's also one annoying thing also is Games Workshop started off as a bit ordering service. So you used to be able to order, if you wanted it, just one Space Marine with a special weapon. Now I have to buy a whole box of Space Marines to get the one part I want. Or to make the one Marine I want. So that kind I thought of reminds Privateer's bit ordering another, service was terrible. That reminds me of another game we were having an issue with. Or Neverwinter, where you wanted to play the one thing. You wanted to play a drow. Yeah. But you would have to buy this whole pretty much expansion pack price yeah. worth of stuff in and order for the right in order to play one yeah, thing. Yeah, if you wanted to play a Dragonborn, it was like two hundred dollars. No, it was seventy some. Oh, seventy some dollars. I still I seem to remember one of the packs was like a hundred. The drow was the hundred. Oh, the drac drow was a hundred dollars and it's like what? I just want to play a drow. I don't want any of this other crap. Just isn't a drow in the in, in like most computer games just a reskinned elf with some different abilities? You would think you so. You would think <laughs> so, yes. But uh, it's a free to play game, so you kind of think, okay, they're gonna get their money from somewhere. Yeah. But that's kind of the opposite of the usual free to play uh, system. <laughs> yeah, the normal free to play. Si- I mean, I can- micro, micro purchases, micro purchases. <laughs> Yes, 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 exactly. $100 rivals some systems. <laughs> yes, $100 is more than I would I... pay for a full game. Come yeah, on, I can, I can get Call of Duty with the uh, season yeah. pass for that. $70 for the Dragonborn is what I would expect to pay for an expansion. Yeah. It, uh, full a, game. Full game. A, an full... expansion for a game is usually $35. Oh, well, yeah. Most DLC is only $10. Depend, depends on the depends DLC. on how much, mm-hmm. but I would say the average DLC is only about ten. If it's adding something like one race, one race and a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't even want. Yeah, it was like a race amount, uh, premium armor. That reminds me of Oblivion when they sold you barding for your mount for real money that did absolutely nothing. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, um, yeah, no thanks. I, so, I don't yeah. like the the pay to win model. I really don't like it, but at the same time, you need to give me something that is uh, worth it. And for me, it's like, okay, well, if I'm going to play this for online, I would like... Uh, <laughs> yes. So why are you thankful for get, for, uh, for Warhammer again? <laughs> I'm thankful for Warhammer because it introduced me to... Miniatures cu- Wargaming miniatures and, and customization. And a beautiful, rich lore that and rich customization... That thankfully the tabletop games don't bend you over and screw you on. The um, Dark Heresy 2nd Edition, Death Watch, and Dark Crusade. And what about the video games? And the video games. Oh, I love Space Marine for the Xbox 360. That's what I was Oh, yes. And Dawn of War. I actually enjoyed that little demo that they put out in order to uh, make keep people excited about it while they were waiting. Yes. You that that was you. yes. I would have had fun playing a Terran though, just running around and eating everything. Oh yeah, and they released uh, what was that? Kill Team, just to keep people interested. That little shooter thing, but then they also released a playable demo, hmm. which was like a part of the f- 
first level and the second. Yeah, uh, one thing I really know about the lore that I know I don't know a whole lot because I don't really pay attention, but I do know that if you're an orc, space orc, you paint it red and it goes faster. Yes, red <laughs> things go faster. Orcs are the most magical, ra- most psychic race in the galaxy because their stuff should not work, <laughs> and it does. Exactly. <laughs> and they reproduce via spores. Oh about. yes, they reproduce via spores. Yes, they're fungus men. They have no. Ge- they actually have no sex, but they, for some reason, are all male, or at least masculine. Yeah, they're probably clones. Another well, fungi. Yeah, close enough. Okay. Essentially kind of cloning. So I'm talking about Dominion. Um, Dominion is another game like I talked about last week with Settlers Catan. It was one of the first uh, deck building card games I ever played. It's actually the first deck builder I ever played. Um, real simple rules to play. You, everyone starts with the same deck. You have, that one, you have one action card that you can play and you have one card you can buy each turn. But with the amount of expansions they released and everything else... It just I love I love the way it increases the complexity of the actual rules, um, in terms of in, in card interactions and everything else. I know some people gripe about Dominion in that it doesn't really have one overarching theme to it. It's each core set has its own theme, and when you start mishmashing it all together, they start to lose the theme a little bit. But the re- b- biggest reason I'm thankful for Dominion is it's that it. Way more so than Settlers of Catan, just because of how easy Dominion is to set up. And most of my gaming friends, if you want to play Dominion, it's... A lot of times people are willing to play, throw down. You just throw down, come out with the card sets, and it's pretty easy for everyone to understand what they are what they could be doing. Most people have a tendency to copy my strategy, which annoys me, but still... <laughs> Well, that's because you have this annoying habit of breaking any meta you touch. I own the game, so I'm the one who understands the card interactions. That too. I'm the one that, I, I mean, and, and most of the interactions I've learned from Dominion are from watching other people. So at Game Town, we used to, there's one town at the store we go to where we do, everywhere, it would seem like almost every other week there there was a someone playing Dominion. And it's where I learned that deck thinning cards like Chapel and Dominion. Why Chapel is just, for its cost, is the best card in Dominion, and it's in the core set, and it ne- that status really never changed. Why is it the best? Because it, it allows your deck to just run. It, it removes all the chaff that you have. And I like the interaction aspect. My favorite card in Dominion is actually Masquerade. It's a real simple card. It's not. It seems like it would be an attack, but it isn't, so it means there's really no counter to it. Draw two cards, everyone passes a card to the player to their left. Useful strategy for players getting rid of curses. Although eventually you have the issue where everyone's passing a curse. That's why there's that nice little added effect of being able to trash any card in your hand afterward. For the person playing the card, at least. But I just love that I just love that interaction in the game, and it was in the first uh, expansion. I just love all the... I just love the interactions for the card game. It's basically why I love Dominion, and it's something that people are almost always willing to play. Okay. Well, we're going to take a break here, and when we get back, we will have Ranger Liz talking to us about The Legend of Zelda. And we're back! Liz, tell us, why are you thankful for Legend of Zelda? I, okay, so when I was talking about Legend of Mana, I was talking about nostalgia. And when I talked about 4E, I was talking about uh, confidence. And then when I talked about Pokemon, I talked about community. And the Legend of Zelda kind of brings together all of that to me. Because, for one thing, as I was growing up, Legend of Zelda, let's see, it came out like shortly after I was born, probably. So, pretty much it was around me ever since I was little. I remember watching you play A Link to the Past. I have distinct memories from when I was really little and didn't really understand much about video games seeing people play the original Legend of Zelda and talking about how innovative it is. So this game has, it, it has, there's a lot of memories tied into it. And then that, that brings up the nostalgic. Community, I've met so many people play, through playing Legend of Zelda. 
I enjoy also the community stuff that goes on with that game. Then confidence. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, you know, when you're going through a, a, a dungeon and you come across a puzzle that stumps you for a moment and then you suddenly get it, there is nothing that boosts your confidence that so much. Though I will say, I will say that thanks to The Legend of Zelda, I have an unrational fear. I have an unrational fear of disembodied hands. They grab me. They take me places I don't want to go, and they usually hurt me in the process. I don't like it. And they do it by scaring the ever-loving crap out of you. Well, yes. There was that one time I, in Twilight Princess, it wasn't even coming after me, that stone hand. It was going after the orb I was taking away taking away from it. And, um, yeah, I was practically hyperventilating by the time I was done with that area. And then in Wind Waker, I had to ask you to take care of the floor masters at one point because I was almost in tears and fear of those things. I don't know why. I I think it's just because I don't like jump scares. And the first time I encountered one, it just sort of came out of nowhere. And then from there, I kind of noticed they sort of had that same pattern of if I'm not paying attention to what's going on. Like, they'll usually make a shadow on the ground. I even know from the original games that they showed up in a shadow always appeared on the ground but if I'm not paying attention I'm going to miss that that little sign telling me I'm about to be grabbed and before I know it there's a hand and it's throwing me at the start of the dungeon and I don't want to be there and I'm missing half of a heart and I'm I'm traumatized oh you're going to love (laughs) Half-Life oh yes yes I am going to love Half-Life and then um, the other thing I will say I'm going to add on to my list of things that I think are important in games. And that is story. Just, I also love lore like Nathan. And even though I'm fairly certain the games were not meant to be tied together in the past, they have put them together. And that's why I loved Hyrule Warriors so much is because it, you, it fit in a way... Well, it doesn't really necessarily fit into the storyline, but it's it like brought the, all the lore together, yeah. and I... It's, all the lore, all the characters, all the time, yes. and all the connected timelines. Yes. So, yeah, it was connecting a whole bunch of stuff, and it was putting people together that probably never would have actually met each other, and so that, to me is a reason why I love Legend of Zelda. I love the story, and, you know, give me a game with just two blobby pixels with a good story that makes me care about those blobby pixels, and that would be good graphics for me any day. That's another thing I have to say. So, one final question. What's your opinion of Zelda 2? Uh, you mean, um, The Adventures of Link? That one, the 2D side-scroller? Yes. I didn't play much about of it. I really should play the original games. I've mostly I played... Um, but I, what I did play, I actually thought it was pretty fun. Okay. I kind of like the little leveling system. Um, I think my favorite one is still... Okay, I kind of have... I'm going to go just go with Wind Waker. Um, that one's story kind of hit home to me because that was the first time Link has had family outside of like an uncle um he had his little sister and being Nate's little sister that just sort of what happens in the storyline just sort of hit home to me and that uh that that game it had an effect and I I loved it plus I know a lot of people complained about sailing but after having a bad day at school or work or something, I could just come home and just hop on the King of Red Lions and sail around the ocean hunting pirates and finding stuff that maybe I didn't feel that into um, exploring before. So, Yeah, um, I think a lot of the hate... For Wind Waker came from one thing, and I'll admit it. It ca- I felt this too, and that is 
when Wind Waker came out, they had previously been getting us pumped, actually, for Twilight Princess. And Twilight Princess was actually not in the works originally. There was supposed to they were be... Go- they were working on something that was going to be graphically like the others. Yep, yeah, it was... But the thing is... It was going to have enhanced graphics for the GameCube, and they showed us all this footage of it, and that's why I thought it was Twilight Princess, because it was the yeah. very beautiful, realistic <clears throat> graphics... And then what we get is looks like a Saturday morning cartoon link, and you know the imagery looks look for Wind Waker looked very cel shaded Saturday morning cartoon, and we were like, this isn't what you promised us. Yeah, it really. It really wasn't, but at the same time, for the story of Wind Waker, there could have been no other palette and design because that link was younger than any other link we've had to date. Mm-hmm. All the other links... All the way through, because most of the other... Oh, well, oh, all the other links were, at the very least, young adults. Um, no, actually, Majora's Mask. Okay, Majora's... And... And that game was and very o- dark. And Ocarina of Time. Yes. Well, yeah, but he also... For half for of the o- game. Yeah, for half the game, and the other half he was an adult. Ocarina of Time was really... not Or Majora's Mask is a really interesting one, because I always say that... Uh, if they went with a more realistic st- style with uh, Wind Waker, they would have had a very dark game in a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, because then they would have gone into more detail of some of the other stuff that was going on. Um, the Majora's Mask, though, needed that style because it was meant to be a dark game and I recommend watching the map pad. We'll I put have, a link yeah. in the uh, comments to that. A description. Or description. We'll put a link in the description to the map pad video. Definitely watch it. Um if you haven't already. But yeah. Alright, well, thank you Liz. And we'll move on to our final part. As always upcoming releases, and things that we'd like you to keep your eye on for a watch. Um, is this going to come out before the 21st? What is? Is this video, is this oh. podcast going to come out before the 21st? Uh, after. After? Oh, well, yeah. uh, Super Smash Brothers for the Wii U will be out. It'll, well, okay, yeah, Super Smash Brothers will have come out yesterday. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we actually record these on Mondays. Yes. So, by the time you hear it on Saturday... So uh, then that also means that Pokemon... The new... Or the remakes of the game that you are playing right now is are going to be coming out on the 21st as well. Ah, so there'll be we're, two new games thinking. out. All right. The only thing that I have to say is that Vampire the Masquerade... Or Vampire the Requiem... Uh, as well as the Masquerade remakes, are out. Um, Requiem version 2, or 2nd edition, will have just come out uh, on Wednesday. It'll be available for download on Drive-Thru RPG. Uh, anybody who had a backer version, or back kickstarted this, uh, they usually give you a early edition. The reason why Onyx Path does this is after their editors have gone through this, White Wolf was notorious for having pages in their printed books that said, please see page XXX. And the editors, you know, would miss that occasionally and it wouldn't get updated. Mm. So, or, and there were still occasional misspellings that by the time the editor had gotten that far in their work, they were kind of brain dead or tired or needed some coffee or something. And it's happened in role-playing game books, you know, not just in White Wolf titles, but White Wolf was the most notorious for it. So Onyx Path, when they took over, what they did is, after being thoroughly edited, Mm -hmm. they give people who kickstarted a copy of the PDF a month early. And then players go through it, 
And they go, hey guys, yeah, you missed this and this and this and this and this. Uh, unpaid editors. <laughs> unpaid editing, yes. It's basically what it is. They crowdsource their editing. <laughs> well, they crowdsource their final editing. Because it's already been edited once. Okay, so they, crowds- they crowdsource their proofreading. Yes, they crowdsource the proofreading. And, uh, I might suggest that for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Dagenborn Rouge! Uh, that'll be a story for another night. Probably <laughs> actually a subject for a whole short video. <laughs> okay. Yes. And anybody looking to get into Vampire, I would say this would be the point to jump in. Okay. Um, there's one thing that I uh, that's coming out. I don't have a release date for it, but um, anyone who follows Privateer Press's stuff, uh, they're starting their previews for the Unleashed uh, book that's coming out uh, early next year. Um, they started that on Friday with a preview of it, and in that preview, they announced that they are releasing a uh, starter set for the Unleashed book. It's going to include a mini adventure. Uh, pre-generated characters. Uh, those pre-generated characters, by the way, appear to be the ones that anyone who played it at Gen Con would have played, which will include the uh, the minis that were there. Oh, awesome. So, for those of you who played it at the pre-gen there, you do get your Gatorman Rifleman miniature, which I'm still hoping turns into a model for the war game, because it's a cool idea. Oh, yeah. So that's what I'm excited for, and apparently they're going to be con- uh, continuing with previews. Uh, it may not be every Friday, but uh, probably going to be on their Insiders on Fridays previews for it. And then, like they did when they first released the uh, um, Full Metal uh, Fantasy book, uh, they're probably going to do their uh, Fridays uh, for bonus content and that kind of thing. So hopefully that... So when all that stuff comes out, it's going to be awesome. Yeah. I was sorry that they discontinued doing that. I... I think they just ran out of ideas. Possibly. Um, because... There's I only thought, so much you can give away for free. Yeah, there's only so much you can give away for free. Um, I did, though, really enjoy it. And I, even if they had just, you know, gone into things like culture or something, I, I would have liked it. And a lot of that stuff was in Kings, Nations, and Gods. So. Yeah. Which I picked up at Gen Con. Uh, Okay, admittedly a few months late, but... So, yep, I'm excited for the starter set. Um, I If they uh, have a way to pre-order it, um, probably when I get my first commission check, I'm going to put that toward pre-ordering that. Don't know if they do that, so... Yeah, yeah, that's the one thing I'm excited for, and I brought that up because I know Nate would be excited for it as well. Yes, definitely excited for that. I love running and playing Iron Kingdoms. It's... In my top three favorite art. So, hang on a second, because I want to hype up next week's podcast. Because I want everyone to know that I'm going to be talking about a game that is very near and dear to my heart as the last game we're going to be talking about for November of the games that we are thankful for. It is a game that has a giant influence on my childhood. And I will tell you what it is next week. It's very Ooh. near and dear to me. Yes, we'll definitely look forward to hearing what that game is. And with that, I leave you with only a few parting words. First, if you enjoy our videos, please hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button so you can and hit them. leave us a comment. Yes, please leave us some comments. We'd love to hear from you. Seriously, we'd love to hear from you. I know it's a possible internet, but constructive criticism. <laughs> yes, constructive criticism would be nice. Because, you know, if there's something that we could do, or if there's something that you like us talking about more... You know, we'll talk yeah. about it. Let, let us know. And if there's something you'd like to hear us talk about more, maybe we can do short a uh, couple of short ten-minute videos about them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fellow adventurers, we will leave you for a week, and we will see you again next week for our final November Games We Are Thankful For podcast. And remember, don't kill us. We're the PCs.